Alright guys, welcome to your first Algebra 2 lesson here. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at EI1 notes, um, specifically linear equations. EI1 notes are both linear and absolute value equations. We are going to focus on just the linear equations today. This section should be primarily or almost entirely reviewed from Algebra 1. but It's going to give us a, a foundation to start um, Algebra 2 content. So let's go ahead and let's jump into solving linear equations. Um, as you guys might remember from Algebra 1, when we solve a linear equation, the goal is to isolate the variable, to get the variable by itself on one side of an equation and to have a constant on the other. And so we have a series of steps that we want to include um, in that process. We're going to use essentially inverse operations to move pieces of the function around or the equation around to isolate that variable. So we can see each of the four steps listed here. If you need to pause the video and, and jot those down in your notes, you can. But we're going to go through these steps in example one. So taking a look at 1a, the first step would be to simplify the equation if needed. In this case, we can see that the, the equation does need to be simplified. We have a coefficient in front of a, an ordered pair. And so what we need to do here is we need to distribute that coefficient. So we distribute the 3 to the x and the 3 to the negative 1. And so that would multiply into 3x minus 3. Everything else in the equation would remain the same. Now we can, again, simplify this equation because I have a 3x and plus x on the left side of the equation. I'm going to go ahead and combine those to make 4x. Again, the rest of the pieces inside the equation remain the same. Now we're on to step two, where we want to rearrange the variables and constants on the opposite side of the equation. So we want our constants, those are going to be our whole numbers, our fractions, or our decimals, away from the variable. So we can do this through addition and subtraction. So if I want to move this negative x that's on the right side of the equation to the left side, I want to do the inverse operation. So this is a negative x. The inverse operation would mean that I need to add it to both sides of the equation. So 4x plus x would be 5x. And on the other side, if I took an x, a negative x, and added x to that, that would become 0. So it essentially moves this negative x to the other side of the equation. I want to do the same thing with this constant. So I have a negative 3 here. If I want to move it to the other side of the equation, I want to add 3 to both sides. So negative 3 plus 3 would be 0. And then 7 plus 3 would give me 10. And finally, I'm on step 4. Step 4, or sorry, step 3. Step 3 says to eliminate coefficients of the variable through multiplication. So we have a coefficient here. This coefficient is 5. If I have 5 times x, I'm going to do the inverse operation and divide by 5 or multiply by 1 fifth, either or. But if I divide both sides by 5, I'll come up with x equals 2. And then this would be my solution, where I got the variable isolated on one side of the equation and a constant on the other side. Now, step four in this process um, we will use when we get to word problems or context problems application. Um, if the solution is needed to answer a question, then we would then add context to that solution. But because we were just solving a linear equation, x equals 2 would be okay for the solution. Let's go ahead and take a look at b. In b, we have a similar type of equation, but I'm going to approach it a little bit differently. First, I want to simplify this equation. In order to simplify this equation, I notice there's a fraction, there's a one-fourth here, and then there's a one-half there. I could distribute those through if, I, if you wanted to, but what that would do is give us some fractions as coefficients to our variables that we would have to work with. So if we want to avoid fractions, what we can do instead is we can multiply by something that's going to get rid of these fractions. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation by 4. So if I multiply both sides of the equation by 4, that 4 is going to be distributed throughout the equation on either side. So I would first take the 4 times this 1 fourth. That would become 1. So that coefficient would cancel out, leaving me with just n plus 8. Now you could leave that as an ordered pair, but in this case, we can go ahead and remove those parentheses because they're not going to have um, a pertinent effect on the equation from this point forward. So now I have n plus 8. Don't forget to distribute this 4 here also to the negative 2. So n plus 8. And then 4 times negative 2 would be negative 8, so minus 8. On the other side of the equation, I need to also make sure I multiply it by 4. So we have to do the same thing to both sides of the equation. In this case, I would take the 1 half times 4, and that would leave me with a 2 in front of this ordered pair. Or this binomial, sorry. 
Now we can clean up this equation, so we can take the plus 8 and the minus 8 and combine those. That would just give me n. On the other side of the equation, I can distribute the 2, so that would give me 2n minus 12. Now I can simplify, or sorry, in this, in this case I can rearrange so the variables are on the same side. So I would subtract 2n from both sides, and that would give me negative n equal to negative 12. And now I need to divide by or multiply by negative 1 to get rid of that negative coefficient. And so n would be 12. Now we can check these answers as well. And I didn't do this on the first problem, but I'll go ahead and do it here. So we can check these answers by substituting in the value that we have for n. So I'm going to go back to the left side of the equation, and I'm going to type in the equation that we see. But I'm going to substitute in 12 where there was an n. And I'm going to evaluate that expression. So the left side of the equation with n equal 12 is equivalent to 3. The right side of the equation, if I do the same thing, is also equivalent to 3. So both sides of the expression have the same value. Therefore, we know n is a solution. Now, if you're feeling comfortable with the process, go ahead and pause the video here, and then you can see if you can solve C on your own. Let's go ahead and take a look at one way to solve C. There's different ways that you could have gone about this. In this case, we do, again, see coefficients. Now, if I divide by 4, that's what I would need to divide by to get rid of both of these coefficients, uh, or multiply by 1 fourth, that would end up giving me some fractions. So I'm not going to approach problem C like I did B. I'm going to approach it more like I did A. We're going to go ahead and simplify by, by distribution. So multiplying the 2x through. This is not the only method, but in this case, maybe the quickest method or the easiest method. I'm going to multiply the or distribute the 4 on the other side of the equation at the same time. 4, they're running out of room. Now we do want to simplify this equation. So on the left side, I can combine the 2x and the 10x to give me 12x. On the right side of the equation, I can combine the 8 and the 4 to give me 12x plus 12. Now, in this case, um, again, we would go ahead and take a look at rearranging the equation, getting the variables to the same side. So I subtract 12x from both sides, and they would essentially become 0. I would add 8 to both sides. So on the left side, I would have 0. If I add 8 to both sides, on the right side here, I'm going to end up with 20. And so what I get here is an expression that is not actually equal. This expression does not work. So we, we know that 0 does not equal 20. And so this is an inconsistent solution, or what we say is no solution. Now, depending on how you did this problem, you may not have come up with 0 equals 20. Um, you may have come up with, like, maybe negative 8 equals 12. Um, or uh, I think you can get 0 equals 17. Um, so you could have got a couple of different answers here. but the key thing here is that at the very end, we should all end up with no solution because we got an expression that was not actually equivalent. Now, we can take this process of solving linear equations and extend it to all variable equations. So if we take a look at 2a, 2a is an expression where we see all variables here, or two variables here. And we can solve for y. Now, the difference here, we're going to follow the same steps, but the difference when we get to the solution is that y is not going to have a numeric value. So let's follow the same process. Um, first, we would simplify the equation if needed. And here in 2a, this one's pretty simplified, so we don't need to do any work there. Then we want to get the variable away from the constant. So our variable that we're trying to solve for is 3y. Now, 2x is technically not a constant, but it's not part of the solution that we're, or it's not part of the, the value that we're trying to solve for. So what we need to do is we need to move this 2x to the other side of the equation. And because it's positive, we can do that through an inverse operation of subtraction. So what we would end up with here is 3y equal to 15 minus 2x after subtracting 2x on both sides. Now we do have a coefficient in front of y, the variable we're trying to solve for. So we want to divide by that coefficient. So divide by 3 or multiply by 1 third. It's the same thing. And when we do that, we would end up with 5 minus 2 thirds x. And this is going to be our solution. Okay, So it's not a numeric value, but it still isolates the variable y and leaves it equal to, in this case, an expression. And that can be a solution. In B, we have the same idea here. 
but the equation is entirely variable. So there's no numbers of any kind. So when we look at this, we see that we're trying to solve for P. So in here, we have two values for P. So what we want to do is solve this in a way that allows us to get a single value of P. So let me put up something a little bit easier. Let's say A equals 2X plus 5X. So if we wanted to simplify this equation, what we'd do essentially is we would add the 2 and the 5 together, the coefficients, and we would get 7X. And that we, we know that's a simplified value for 2X plus 5X. We can do the same thing here with A, so or with B. So if I were to rewrite A, A would be 1P plus RT times P. Same value, just a different way to write the equation. Now, the reason I wrote that the equation that way is because now I can add the coefficients. So I can take 1 plus RT, group those together, and add them together, times P. So I'm just adding the coefficient from each term of P together into a group. Now, we cannot simplify that. We can't add the constant to the variables. But in this case, now that's a coefficient for P. So we can divide both sides by 1 plus RT. And that gives us an expression that is equal to P. Additionally, to solving linear equations, we can use linear equations to solve application problems. So if we take a look at problem number three. Problem number three says the largest state in the United States is Alaska, which covers an area that is 230 square miles more than 500 times that of the smallest state, Rhode Island. If they have a combined area of 616,460 square miles, how many square miles does each cover? So in this case, we are looking to solve this problem by finding the area that Alaska covers and the area that Rhode Island covers. So I'm going to use a variable A for Alaska and a variable R for Rhode Island. And I'm going to take the information that's presented to write an equation. So it says Alaska covers an area that is 230 square miles more than 500 times Rhode Island. So my first equation could be A equals 230 more would tell us that we need to add 230 to something. So 230 plus 500 times more than Rhode Island. Rhode Island would be an R. That would be 500 times R. So this gives us an equation, but we can't solve this equation by itself. So what we can do is we can take a look at that last sentence to create another equation. It says if they have a combined area of 616,460 square miles. So combined area would be A plus R. We're combining the two of these. Now, this second equation we can't solve by itself either. But what we are able to do here is we are able to substitute in a value for A. So we know A equals this expression. So I can take this expression right here and substitute that in for A, replacing the value A with the expression 230 plus 500R. And now I do have an equation with a single variable that I can solve. So we can combine the values for R. So I'd get 230 plus 501R equal to 616,460. Now I would want to rearrange so all the constants are on the same side of the equation. So subtract 230 from both sides. So I get 501R equal to 616,230. And now I need to get rid of that coefficient for R. So I'm going to need to do some division here. I'm going to need to take 616,230 and divide it by 501 because I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 501. So R equals 1230. And now this is where we need to add some context. So we let R be the area of Rhode Island. So we can add some context here and say that Rhode Island covers 1,230 square miles. And so that's the first part of our answer. Now also, we need to figure out how many miles that Alaska covers. And so now that we know the value for R, we can go back to our equation for A and substitute. 
So 230 plus 500 times R, which we just found out was 1230. And there is our value for A. So Alaska is 615,230 square miles. And there we have our solution. So when we do complete word problems or problems, application problems where our answers, we're finding a purpose for this answer to, to answer a question, we need to make sure that we add some contents back into that question. This is a good place to stop for day one. So when we come to class on Monday, we are going to work on, uh, we're going to cover some questions. If you guys have questions over how to solve linear equations, and then we are going to work on the homework problems that correlate to this video.